Thank you very much. Also, thank you very much for uh, the invitation to speak here. Um, I'm going to talk about a model of a charged polymer, a randomly charged polymer that uh, is uh, an object about which uh, we've tr been trying to understand for a number of years how we could, uh, how we could possibly uh, uh, describe this. And I will be focusing on an, an annealed version of this charged polymer. And annealed means that there is randomness in the polymer configuration and there's also randomness in the charges that are living on the polymer and we take both of them into account. Uh, the quenched model is a model about which we know very little uh, uh, to say anything, but it's presumably also not so interesting as the annealed uh, model. But let me not run ahead of myself. Uh, this is a uh, work in progress with Francesco Caravenna and Nicolas Petrelis and uh, Julien uh, uh, Poisat. Where are you, uh, Julien? There's Julien. And, um, and we are we're close to, uh, to finishing this, but there's still a couple of loose ends that we need to... Uh, that we need to settle. So before I give you the precise model, uh, uh, let me uh, step back one second and say where, where, where this might come from. Um, you know, long polymer chains uh, and, and DNA and proteins are, are examples of that. They, they can be polyelectro po polyelectrolytes, so this means that the monomers that make up this long chain of, uh, of a polymer can have a charged, uh, a charged, uh, a charge attached uh, to it. Now you should think of the monomers can be actually quite complicated units all by themselves, but uh, th th these units can have a charge and it's also possible that the charge moves around the chain. It can actually change also over time and it can change in space. And uh, this is also, triggered by uh, a possible solution that your chain is living in, or so let's say some, some environment in which it lives. And uh, already some, almost 25 years ago, there was a model proposed, uh, a very simple model of a charged uh, polymer chain. And, uh, but it has taken a very long time to, to be able to really understand much about this uh, model. Actually, the model came from, from a completely different direction. About it. I have no time to tell you about that, but, but we can pop immediately to this model and see uh, what, what it is and what one might ask about it. Um, I'm going to focus on D is 1. This is a very severe limitation. I'm not going to tell you anything about what this model uh, could or should be doing in higher dimensions, but we do believe that the phase behavior that I'm going to describe is also going to be there in, in, in higher dimensions. We will have less, uh, certainly less, less uh, uh, possibilities to say much about it in detail, and the advantage of being in one dimension is that we can really say a lot. Yeah, and there's, there, there's interesting scaling behavior coming up. So the thing that we want to do is to look at what such a randomly charged, randomly configured polymer chain is going to do when it becomes very large. Okay, now in order to define the model, I need five ingredients. And only after I've gone through these five ingredients can I actually say what, uh, what the model really is. So we begin by uh, worrying about what could be the spatial configurations of the polymer chain even when we're not yet thinking about the charges. And it is standard practice to say, well, there is a reference post process. In our case, it will be simple random walk on the integers starting at the origin 
And if this polymer would have no interaction uh, with anything or with itself, it would just be behaving as a simple random walk on the latter. So then you think of this path and you think of this path describing how your polymer is sort of folded into one dimensional uh, space. And so this is our reference uh, process and I'm going to use the letter, the straight letter P to describe everything that denotes probability with respect to simple random walk. And then we're going to decorate the polymer with randomly chosen charges. And the way this is done is that we're choosing an ID sequence of real valued random variables, omega i, and we think of omega i as the electric charge that is located on the ith monomer in my long polymer chain. So the, uh, the polymer chain consists of n monomers, and, uh, and I think of omega i as the charge that is on that monomer. And I'm going to use this double script P for everything that deals with randomness of this sequence omega i. So the script, the, the straight P for the randomness of the configuration and the double P for the randomness of the polymer chain. And we're going to assume that these random variables are standardized, so they have uh, zero mean and they have unit variance. Uh, that is no loss of generality, as we will see in a second. And so this is the second ingredient that we need to build up our, um, our model. And there are three more to come. Now, <coughs> we do want to allow for charges that are biased. So we do not want uh, only a situation where the charges have mean zero, so that if you take a very long polymer chain, that the polymer chain on average is, is neutral. No, we want to allow for some biases. And the way we build that in is through an extra tilting parameter, delta. So you can start with your ID uh, uh, random charges that are standardized and then you can tilt them with the parameter delta so as to make them uh, so, so as to make the mean also different from zeros and this the the, the reason of doing it like this uh, is is convenient because with this in this way we do, we, we get a whole one parameter family of of charge distributions uh, uh, parameterized by this tilting parameter. So the delta tells us, yes, we, are, we do allow also our random variables to be uh, sort of tilted. So if you switch on delta to be positive, it means that your charges on average are positive. And if you would take a very long uh, polymer chain, you would see that there are more plus values than minus values on this chain. And we're going to assume that uh, this, uh, our, our random variables have a finite moment generating function. This will be important for later. And then we now come to say, well, what, is, what are these configurations and these charges really doing in our model? And for that, we introduce an interaction Hamiltonian, a very uh, standard uh, uh, way of doing things in, in statistical physics. You say, well, let's consider a space pi of all possible uh, uh, simple random walk paths starting at the origin, and let's look at the space of all possible outcome of my uh, charge sequences. And with every of these two realizations, we're going to associate an energy. And the energy is written here. You, uh, so remember that SI means the position of the ith monomer in my polymer chain, which is lying in this one dimensional lattice. On this polymer chain, there are charges. So the ith monomer has a, has a charge omega i. And now, if I look at the combination of the two, then this is an energy that says, OK, if two, if the two monomers i and j 
visit the same site, they land on top of each other, then if the charges that are associated with these monomers I and J have the same sign, then there's a, rep a repulsion, so that will cause a high energy uh, that is locally uh, attributed, whereas if they have the opposite sign, it's a minus and it gets a low energy. So in the landscape of all possible polymer configurations and all possible charge distributions on the polymer, this describes an energy as you would associate it to the polymer because it is interacting with itself through the charges. And Charges with the same sign attract each other. Charges of the same sign, uh, of different sign, uh, sorry, of the same sign repel each other, and of different sign attract each other. And this is a fair way of assigning an energy to the configuration S and the charge distribution omega. And then, um, in order to capture that in the appropriate uh, statistical physics language, we need another parameter, which is the inverse temperature, which is uh, typically denoted by beta. It's some non-negative uh, number. And so at this point, we already have two parameters. There's the tilting parameter delta for the charges, and there's the inverse temperature beta, and uh, everything. So the, the, relative, the, the relevant parameter space for us is the positive quadrant where delta is living here and beta is living here. So this positive quadrant is for us the interesting parameter space. And now you say, well, given two parameters delta and beta in that quadrant, now what you build is the Gibbs measure associated with that interaction Hamiltonian. So it's e to the minus beta times the Hamiltonian, and you have to normalize it. And the, me the Gibbs measure is the measure for which I use the symbol with the p and the lower index n and the two parameters. And it is simply the tilting according to the uh, Gibbs uh, Boltzmann factor with respect to the reference measure under which the, uh, I'm, I'm having simple random walk and I'm having ID tilted random variables. So what this Gibbs measure does, it favors combinations of configurations of the polymer and charges for which the energy is small and it disfavors configurations for which it is high. So in particular, configurations under which many charges land on top of each other that have the same sign are going to be less probable under this measure than configurations under which there are signs, uh, there are charges meeting of opposite sign. Okay, so those are the, uh, those are the ingredients of the model and let me uh, remind you here, so this is the charge bias. That's one parameter that we can play with, and if delta is equal to zero, it means uh, on average the, char the, the polymer is uh, neutrally charged. And here is the inverse temperature. Maybe I should write a bit bigger. And I do this for every fixed n, and for every fixed n, this describes the, the configuration uh, charge distribution uh, at those parameters in this model. And again, so very important here, these, these, uh, the, 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 there's, there's an on-site interaction, you only interact, so you, you, you should think of the chain as interacting with itself only on site. And uh, now this is a restriction because in, uh, in reality uh, charges really have, have, a, have of course a Coulomb uh, interaction, but I'll come back to the end to say something more about that. So, so this is a very simple toy model and uh, still it has 
it has defied uh, uh, analysis for, for many years. Um, now, let's look at the bottom here. Um, this model has as limiting cases some well-known objects, and they, they, they tie in nicely with what Gadi was talking about uh, before. First of all, if I don't have any, uh, so if beta is equal to zero, then the whole interaction is killed, and I'm back to, to, to simple random walk. So beta equal to zero is what, what's happening on this line here isn't very interesting. That's just classical simple random walk. Also, if you think of the special case where the omegas would be plus or minus one, randomly with probability one half, then if I send my parameter delta to infinity, it means that I make my polymer entirely consisting of pluses. And if, and if the omega is, is, is plus one everywhere, then my model simply becomes the model of of a weekly, uh, weekly self-avoiding walk, in which you say every, every self-intersection gets a certain penalty, in this case e to the minus beta, whereas Gadi had, uh, had uh, one minus beta. And uh, so the weekly self-avoiding walk case corresponds to delta equal to infinity, at least when the charges are, uh, let's say, bounded, and, uh, and, and uh, the self-avoiding walk is yet another uh, limiting case of that. So this model includes uh, these, uh, these, uh, these models. And what is hard uh, about the model uh, is that it has both attractive and repulsive interactions together. And for instance, if you look at how the lace expansion is built up, then it's very important that self-avoiding walk has only repulsive interaction because you need to successively estimate diagrams and if you would put attraction in the model it becomes hard to, uh, to deal with that. So, so, so the lace expansion really only works for repulsive models and the moment you add attraction you're in trouble. Now there's, there's, there's very interesting recent work by, by Roland uh, Bauerschmidt who is able to take the weekly self-avoiding walk and add a tiny little bit of attraction and, and still uh, show that, that, uh, that, that things can work. But in general, if you mix interactions, uh, it gets complicated. And so this is the challenge that we're trying to face here. Now, before I'm going to state the, the, the sort of the first uh, results, I, I want to say, well, actually, we're going to work with a slightly modified Hamiltonian. Uh, originally, we had the i's and j's, the i and j ordered. I had to be smaller than j, but we're going to symmetrize the sum. Well, that is not a big deal because that means you replace beta by two beta. That's uh, almost nothing, but we're also going to add the diagonal terms uh, and if the omega i's would be plus and minus one, that would have no effect whatsoever. It would mean that you add a constant, but if they're not, then that also means that you are effectively changing the bias a little bit. So it means that instead of delta, you get something slightly different. But as long as we stay in the world of general beta and general data, delta, we may as well look at this model uh, in, uh, rather than the model that I started out with. And the advantage of that is that we're able to write the Hamiltonian as the sum over all points of a, the square of a sum. And what this sum does is that it takes a certain site, and each time the polymer comes there, it registers the charge that the polymer has when it visits that site, and it essentially adds up all these charges. Now, if the charges would all be plus one, then this would just become the local time at site X, and this Hamiltonian would have become the sum over all sides of the square of the local times of, of, uh, of your path, and that's, that's what you uh, have when you study weekly self-avoid. 
And so th th this is a kind of weighted local time. At every site, you keep track when you get there, and, and you have to sort of add up all the charges uh, that land on that particular site. So, and, and, uh, and this uh, is the object that we have to try and understand. Okay. Any questions at this point? Because that's, that's the definition uh, of the model. Okay, um, I'm going to throw at you today and Wednesday something like 10 theorems that describe uh, the phase diagram of this model in, uh, in, 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 uh, in a lot of detail. And they come in two parts. There will be some general parts that are properties that are sort of more qualitative, and there are also some more detailed uh, properties, asymptotic properties that look at certain scaling as you move, uh, as you zoom in to a certain part of your, uh, of your phase space. And let's see how far we, we get today. So the free energy is uh, the free energy will, which will depend on delta and beta will be the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n, the logarithm of your partition function, which depends on these, uh, on these numbers. And this is the free energy. And this, as we know from, from statistical physics, is the key object that you have to analyze uh, uh, to, to, to understand what your random polymer is doing. In a sense, the free energy is a kind of huge generating function out of which you can pull all sorts of things, interesting things, by looking at how it depends on the parameters. Now, I'm going to, the, the first theorem uh, will give you a spectral representation of this free energy for our charged polymer model. And in order to do that, I need a number of ingredients. And eventually, there will be a picture, which I think it's better to, to immediately draw. So uh, there will be another parameter mu, which I will introduce in a second. And then there will be, uh, there will be two curves. One curve will be a certain log lambda that will depend on our parameters and on this extra parameter, this, this will be an extra uh, parameter that plays the role of being able to handle these weighted local times. And there will be another curve, which will be the logarithm of another function. And they will be organized in this way, and they, they will go through zero at two possible values. One is called mu, what we call mu de delta beta, and there will be another which will be located like here. So, so this is the kind of picture that uh, uh, will appear later, but it's good to have it there so that uh, in order for, for uh, what is coming now to sort of appreciate this. Okay, so on my way to this first theorem, which will give a spectral representation of our free energy, uh, I need another bunch of ingredients. Again, there will be five objects that I need to introduce. So please bear with me. To begin with, there is a particular probability matrix living on n0 cross n0. For me, n0 is the integers including 0, and without the 0, it is the integers without the, the 0. I'm, I'm, I'm probably sinning against uh, French uh, uh, traditions here, but uh, th that's how I, uh, how I do it. And this is a certain matrix. It's, it's over there. And actually, what this is, this matrix is the transition kernel of a critical Galton Watson branching process with a geometric offspring distribution. 
So geometric width parameter half because it's 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 critical, and uh, and this this is an object that pops out of our analysis and and it has a particular form. It's it's over there, and you see that zero is a trap. Once you start in zero, you you stay zero, and that simply means if your process dies out, uh, it will remain died out forever. So this is a a, a classical object. And the reason why it uh, uh, appears here, uh, I will explain to you later. And then uh, there is a certain cumulant generating function. I am going to take, I'm going to define omega L as the sum of all the charges uh, in a piece of length L in the polymer, where L can be any number including zero and omega l is just the sum of l of them and if l is zero then this sum is empty and omega zero is zero and if you don't look at this term for a second then you say well this is just the moment gen generating function um, of uh, this is just the cumulant generating function for the distribution of L of these random variables. The reason why we need this one here as well had to do with the fact that we actually decided to change our Hamiltonian a little bit and say I want to symmetrize it so that I can write it as a nice square. And the price you pay for that is you have this term here. Now, if all your charges would be sort of plus or minus uh, one, you really wouldn't have uh, to worry about this, but it's there. Okay, so and think of this as a kind of joint generating function that describes uh, the, the distribution of, of the charges on a stretch of uh, length L. Okay, so it's all uh, again explicitly described here. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to build out of these two previous ingredients uh, another matrix. I'm going to take the Q matrix. Well, there's a small shift in the first index. Okay. And then I'm going to multiply this matrix by E to the uh, plus this cumulant generating function. And then I'm going to put something in front which uh, has to do with an extra parameter that's a, a parameter that I want to play with uh, so, so that I can tune things. And then I get uh, a matrix which is completely explicit. Uh, the, the moment you give me a distribution of the charges, then this matrix is there. And that's the key matrix for, for our whole analysis. And it turns out, and do not yet look at the A twiddle matrix. This is uh, it's an it's an infinite matrix, but it's a very nice matrix because uh, uh, it, it when you view it as operating on L two of n zero, it's actually a Hilbert Schmidt operator. So so uh, which basically says it has very nice spectral properties, and you can essentially think of it as as a finite matrix. So this matrix has very good tails, in particular also because of this Q matrix that has very good tails. So this looks like a complicated matrix. It is a bit complicated, but it's completely explicit, but it has very nice properties uh, that uh, will tell you that it has a nice, uh, uh, it has a nice uh, uh, principal eigenvalue. And this principal eigenvalue of that matrix is what is called lambda, delta, beta. And it depends. So the delta and the beta are the two parameters in our model. And mu is another parameter I want to play with. It plays the role of a kind of Lagrange multiplier. And then it turns out that this spectral radius as a function of mu, if I plot the logarithm of that thing, it just is a nice curve that uh, that goes like this. The curve might start below uh, the orange, and depending on which choice of delta or beta pick. But it's it's a it's a, it's a continuous, strictly decreasing and log convex function. It's it's analytic, certainly uh, 
for positive uh, mu. It is also, uh, you know, it has everywhere, you know, it's everywhere the, the, the differentiable. It has a nice slope. So, so this is a nice object. The mu is going to be, be an extra parameter which, which I can play because I, I have these, uh, these, these local times with all these weights and this parameter, mu, uh, will play the role of a kind of uh, Lagrange multiplier that I can play with and, and I, I really need it to, uh, to, to describe this. Okay, now... Uh, I actually also need a matrix that is slightly different from A. It's, it's a matrix that is sort of shifted a little bit and then uh, on the, for i is equal to zero, it becomes zero. Uh, I, I will explain to you in a second how, where this arises. And this matrix also is still nice. It's still Hibbert Schmidt, it still has a nice uh, uh, spectral radius and the spectral radius of this matrix lies just a little bit below the spectral radius of this curve here. So it just so happens that there is another matrix very close to, to the A matrix but we, we do need it in our analysis uh, that also has a spectral representation and that actually the curve everywhere lies below the curve uh, for the A matrix. Okay, so a complicated object but still very explicit and the moment you give me a nice distribution for your charges, for instance standard Gaussian, I can, uh, everything is explicit here. Now, um, and then what I need is the two points where these curves cross the value zero. So it's where these lambdas here become one, so where the spectral radii of these matrices become one, and that happens at two values which we call mu of delta beta and mu twiddle of delta beta. And so they're, divi they're, they're defined by these points. Now the moment any of these curves lies below the axis, there's no intersection with uh, the zero line and we define them to be equal to zero. So if you move this line down, you will see that this creeps to zero and when you go below it stays stuck at zero. So that's what we define to be these numbers. And these two numbers here are the key to our spectral representation for uh, the free energy, which I'm going to uh, explain next. So here's the picture that I drew on the blackboard, and there it is. So uh, the key objects being these points where these lambdas go from being larger than one to smaller than one. Okay, so here's the first uh, theorem that's with which we start off uh, our analysis of the, uh, of the charged polymer. It says, for every point in that quadrant, and the quadrant does not it does not contain this line here. This line here is forbidden because that would correspond to having no interaction and everything I'm going to say is not true on that, on that line, but uh, we understand everything. Okay, it says everywhere in that quadrant the annealed free energy exists, so the free energy indeed uh, uh, has a limit. Uh, this limit is non-positive, okay, and it is nevertheless finite, and it satisfies a certain inequality, it has a lower bound. This free energy is, below, is larger than or equal to F delta, and F delta is uh, my uh, abbreviation for minus the logarithm of the moment generating function of my charges. 
And so the free energy exists. It is bounded from above by zero, but it's bounded from below by something that is finite and negative. And what we will see later is that this lower bound uh, comes from the fact that the polymer can always do something very simple, namely, it could tilt its charges so that the total charge distribution, that the total number of charges on your polymer is roughly zero. Then your polymer becomes a kind of almost on average neutral object. And what your random walk is going to do is sort of typical. It's going to be behave you know, roughly like simple random walk. This is not actually true, as we will see very, by the very end, but you know, for the sake of the argument, yes. And then your free energy has to be at least as um, big as this F delta. So a free energy uh, is always at least something where you say, well, how much does it cost for my charges to make the polymer neutral? And then afterwards, the random walk uh, can do whatever it wants. Okay. Now, since there is a lower bound, we can introduce something that is called the excess free energy. So it would be the free energy minus its lower bound. And that object can be zero or it can be positive. And we will get back to that in a second. And it is this excess free energy that is really the interesting object to look at. And this excess free energy has a spectral representation. It's exactly given by this value of mu, where this curve crosses 0. So it is the mu value that makes the spectral radius of my matrix A to be exactly 1. OK, and, and so here uh, there is a spectral representation then of this excess free energy. We've taken off a trivial part uh, F delta, also explicit. And here we know what our free energy is. It comes in terms of the point where the spectral radius of a certain matrix not an easy matrix, but an explicit matrix equals one. And so with that, we have, a, we have a spectral representation of the free energy. And we would then be in business to say, now let's analyze this object. And how does it uh, depend on the parameters delta and beta? And what, uh, what can we then pull out of the phase diagram? OK. So this is the first. Uh, uh, of the of our theorems. Yeah. The Q is the, the this whole this whole thing here is the quadrant Q. So that that that's my basic probability uh, my basic parameter space in uh, in which I, I want to, to look at. Inverse temperatures are, are non-negative, and the charge biases, you take them positive. If you take them negative, it's no loss of generality. OK. OK. Now, how does this story come about? And uh, the, the, the reason it comes about is that we are able to get uh, a representation for the generating function of my partition sums. And so if I take my partition sum, my annealed partition sum over there, it depends on the length n of the polymer and the parameters delta beta, I multiply it by e to the minus f delta beta so that the combination of the last terms is what I would call the excess annealed partition function because I'm taking off the, the part that corresponds to the lower bound. And I put this into a generating function. So the mu plays the role of, a, of the parameter in a generating function for uh, our partition sum. Then we are able to show that this generating function has an explicit representation that is written here. You take your matrix A and you take your matrix 
matrix A twiddle, and you make up this combination and you look at the element 0, 0. And the claim is that that generating function is equal to the 0, 0 matrix element of this object here. I've put a little star there, which I will tell you uh, in a second what it means, and Julien already knows what it means. Now, where does this come from? Uh, this comes from the fact that uh, one-dimensional simple random walk uh, has, if you look at the local times of one-dimensional simple random walk, there is something called the Ray Knight representation. And so the local times of simple random walk uh, can be described by uh, it, 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 it has a certain Markov structure and actually what is happening if you take the origin and you look at where the polymer where your simple random walk ends then there is a, a region in space in between these points and then there are also let, let me put the, the, the brackets here and then there's also pieces uh, outside that. So my walk starts here, it ends there, it could have gone to the left here and, and it could have gone to the right here, but it starts here and it ends there. And so there are sort of three regions that it visits. The visits the region in between its beginning point and end point and the two pieces sticking out. And the local times of uh, of the, the random walk in here, in the middle piece are described by the A matrix and in the boundary pieces are described by the A twiddle matrix. That's basically what, uh, uh, what is happening. So if we want to understand the entire local time distribution of simple random walk, you cut it into three pieces and it turns out that the matrix A describes what my charged polymer is doing in this part of the space and the matrix A twiddle is uh, capable of describing what happens in these two boundary pieces. And the boundary pieces are a bit different because here you, you, you explore but you must come back to here and the same thing here, you can only perform loops here whereas in the end here you 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 don't have a loop because you go from one point to another and it's this slight qualitative difference between these outside pieces and the middle piece that causes that uh, that what you put here is not exactly the matrix a but a slight perturbation of that and that's where it comes from now the whole derivation behind this is is complicated you, you have to, uh, no, it's not complicated, but you, you have to write out everything in terms of, uh, you know, your, your nil partition function as sum of local times, and then you have to write your local times in terms of crossing numbers, and then you have to make sure that, that everything sort of lands on the right uh, place, and you want to get a formula that captures everything uh, uh, precisely. But in the end, uh, you obtain a formula like this. And, and, and the fact that it is possible is, is a known thing. I mean, the, 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 the Raynite representation has been used for Brownian motion, where it's actually e even nicer than, than for simple random walk. And, uh, and many people have used this uh, successfully. And in the language of this annealed uh, partition function, if we put everything together nicely, we end up with this formula. But the core of the argument is still that there is this Ray Knight description of uh, local times. Right, so the message is your two matrices give you a formula for, your, for the generating function of the partition function that you're interested in. The little star means that in between here there is yet another third matrix that really uh, is some kind of something that is half 
a and half a twiddle uh, and it's of no no relevance whatsoever so i've just took it out not to not to confuse you so there's a small amendment but of of absolutely no relevance but what this says is that look the the free energy this excess free energy would be the value where of the value of mu where this thing starts to explode right so this sum is finite for mu large enough and if i make mu smaller and if i would make mu smaller than the free energy then it that sum would start to explode. And so, from this spectral representation, we see that that is going to happen when my matrices A and A twiddle are going to have a uh, spectral radius 1, because that's exactly when this object is exploding. And because the spectral radius of the A matrix is bigger than the spectral radius of the A twiddle matrix, it is this denominator here uh, in the middle that will tell you exactly when this quantity will explode and that's exactly when the lambda hits uh, when you pick mu such that this spectral range of that matrix is one and uh, and that explains where this theorem one comes from that it is indeed the 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 radius of convergence of this sp uh, of this uh, generating function right now since we have a lower bound for our spectral radius we can uh, wonder well when is this lower bound reached or not and we can define two phases. We could say there's a region in my quadrant, which I would call P, strictly larger than, as all those points where this excess free energy is not zero but is strictly positive. And I can define the complement of this region where, uh, where uh, the, the excess free energy is zero. And it turns out that uh, this region sort of looks like this. There's a certain curve, beta critical delta, where here below the free energy is strictly positive, and here the excess free energy is equal to zero, and on the curve, because the free energy is continuous on this curve, the free and the excess free energy is still zero, but it starts to become strictly positive when you go below this curve. And I drew the curve of a certain shape there, and uh, one of the theorems will be to actually s state that this uh, shape is given like that. And so here, this lower bound was achieved by saying I pay a certain amount to make my charges on the average neutral and then on a neutral chain there's you know on average almost no interaction and simple random walk is doing what it uh, typically wants to do and this picture is saying when beta is large or delta is small that actually is the best thing you can do. That is what determines your free energy. Whereas there's another region below this curve where you say, no, that is not what the chain is doing. It's apparently able to do something else and make its free energy really bigger than zero. And we will have to go into more detail about what that could be. So describing what the polymer chain is actually doing. Okay, so here comes the second theorem. It says, uh, okay, there is a certain critical curve that uh, uh, separates these two regions where you're strictly positive or zero in your excess free energy. And for every delta, there's a unique uh, 
value uh, of this critical curve. And this critical curve is actually obtained by asking yourself, when is this point here going to hit zero? So the critical picture, so you are in a critical situation when your curve looks like this. So uh, mu, and here I'm plotting uh, log lambda delta beta mu. So if your curve, if your parameters are such that your curve looks like this, then, then this is the situation for criticality. So find the delta beta for which the spectral radius of the parameter with mu equal to zero is exactly equal to one. And this critical curve is continuous, it's strictly increasing, it's convex, it's analytic on the open half line and it touches zero as I go down into this corner. So indeed this curve looks, looks like that qualitatively. And out of the spectral representation we also get that well, the free excess free energy here is not very interesting because it's identically equal to zero. But in this region, except on the phase transition line, it's also an analytic function of the parameters. And this comes out of the fact that this matrix A is a Hilbert-Schmidt uh, operator and therefore uh, there are, there are, it, it's quite standard that its uh, principal eigenvalue is also a, a, an an analytic function of the parameters. Basically, if all your matrix elements are analytic functions of your parameters and your hilbert smith then also your principal eigenvalue is, uh, is, uh, is an analytic function. Okay. Um, I want to, to uh, conclude by stating a law of large numbers now and for that we're going to look at the displacement divided by n so we're going to look at the end point of the polymer divided by n and so this is what we call the empirical speed of the polymer and we're also going to sum up all the charges along the polymer and divide by n so this will be what is called the empirical charge and it turns out that these two objects satisfy uh, a law of large numbers on the uh, uh, under the annealed measure. I'll come back to, to this notation uh, shortly. Uh, it's, uh, the, the statement is for every point in the quadrant there is a speed, a limiting speed, so the displacement under this annealed polymer measure, the empirical speed minus this number v delta beta is tending to zero and the condition Sn positive is put there in order to choose a direction because there's complete symmetry for the polymer moving in one direction or in the other direction and let's make one of the two to say well let's look at what it's doing when it goes to the right. And this number is zero in a certain part of this parameter space and it's strictly positive on the complement and it has a certain spectral representation. In fact, what you should do is to go to this point, draw the tangent and then minus one over this tangent is this number v delta beta and this v delta beta plays the role of a speed. And let me go back to say what this b and this v are. This, the, 
The B region is everything that is below and on the curve. So that would be the B region. And everything that is strictly above the curve is the S region. And B stands for ballistic. And S stands for sub-ballistic. So the speed here, I already said in this region you are going to make your charges neutral and your typical behavior will be a little bit like simple random walk and you will not be ballistic. But if you're in this region, there is so much repellence in your model, the charges are biased, they are sufficiently biased that indeed uh, the repulsion makes the typical behavior of the polymer such that it becomes positive. And what is remarkable is that the phase transition is first order, so the speed does not go to zero as you approach the critical line. It approaches a strictly positive value when you're on the critical line, and then it suddenly jumps to zero. So the, the speed of the polymer makes a jump at the critical line. And so this is something that we uh, did not anticipate, but it came out of the spectral analysis. And I'm close to, to uh, I, I need a few more minutes and then I'll stop. Um, there's also a statement for the empirical charge. If I look at the empirical charge on the polymer chain, there is a number, a rho delta beta, to which this will converge. And also this number uh, has a dichotomy. It's strictly positive in the ballistic region, and it's zero in the non-ballistic region. So everywhere, including this line and below this line, the, the typical charge distribution of the polymer will be such that it is on average positive. And again, there's an explicit formula for what this charge distribution is. It is the derivative of this point here as you vary the delta. So uh, again, you, we, we, uh, we can relate these objects immediately to this spectral <laughs> Uh, radius. So we have a phase diagram now with a ballistic phase and a sub-ballistic phase. The ballistic phase includes the critical line, which is another way of saying the phase transition is really first order. And here we have plotted what we think is the dependence as a function of beta of these two objects, this limiting speed and the limiting charge uh, as a function of beta. And, uh, but, but we have not uh, yet been able to prove these pictures. Uh, th so th th that it would be perfectly this shape. We know that it's roughly this shape and also roughly that shape, but they should look like this, but we would need to go deeper into the spectral analysis to pull, to pull that out. Okay. So let me stop here and what I'm going to do next time is I'm going to tell you about large deviation principles, central limit theorems, and I'm going to also tell you about some uh, scaling properties of the free energy in, uh, in a as you move to the critical curve or you move into this corner or you move close to this axis. There are some interesting anomalous scaling properties that I will tell you about on Wednesday. Thanks a lot. Uh, just if I get it right, the, your Hamiltonian only depends on the total charge on every side. On um, it is, yeah, yeah. It, is uh, is yeah. this physically relevant or? Well, so you for every side you need to sum up the charges that the polymer puts there, and then you have to square it. Yeah, right. because it seems like if on a side you have very different charges, it won't make the same physical behavior of, as having 
the same mean, the same total charge, but exactly. So, so, and that, that, that's exactly why why the, the, the what is really happening is something that is global, and that uh, and and this is somehow all folded up in this big matrix A that looks at at everything sort of together, or at least at the at the Markovian structure that is behind there. And so it's not at all, you, you, you cannot at all think of what's happening at different sites as being, as being independent. You, 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 you would not get the same uh, thing at all. So it's really delicate about, you know, this, this, this order uh, is lying all over this polymer chain and then this polymer chain tries to fold itself over the space and which charge lands somewhere else. If I, if I change one step in the random walk, it goes, uh, for instance, then the walk goes to the left and then to the right, or I would make it go to the right and then to the left, and all the charges, uh, a certain part of the charges are shifted, and, and your Hamiltonian is different. So your Hamiltonian is very non-local. The questions? Uh, one question. In the sub-ballistic regime, it may be transient, or do you think it could be the transient sub-ballistic regime? Or it's, uh, no, no, no. It's not. Uh, it has not. The, in the, it, it will be recurrent. Always in the, in in the, the sub-ballistic sub regime. Yeah, in the sub-ballistic regime, one can actually prove that it's sub-diffusive, uh, which I will mention at the very end on, on Wednesday. That uh, there's there's. Uh, then actually when the charges are neutral, it sort of even means that the, the, the attraction sort of wins from the accuracy. So, so you really go from sub-diffusive to uh, ballistic behavior uh, right at the critical point. Any other questions? So, let's find okay.